let's go. So look, a bit of background about me, and Dave's given some of the, uh, some of the explanation, a bit about my background. Um, I didn't have Pronet on here, uh, I didn't fully own it, I had a licence, so I probably didn't call it for that. Um, founding a lot of internet businesses here in Australia, typically in infrastructure, uh, I seek was uh, back in its day in David Pornet, into H2, which is uh, the first, we did the first filtered search engine, I think, in Australia, and uh, the first filtered internet backbone, which we did with Optus, way back in the day, uh, 1998, 1999. Uh, and then we sold out of that in 2000. Um, the, my co-founder of that business, Jason Gomesel, continued it on and, and, and is still there, I think, today. Uh, Pipe Networks, I started with another Rocky School friend, Steve Baxter, um, and, uh, and basically it was to set up to the simple principle, we're going to set up an internet exchange business. I believe there was a, a, an opportunity for a commercial IX in Australia, which we didn't have at the time, one that kind of gave SLAs and real customer focus and attention. And we, we nearly went ahead, uh, and we're going, going to go ahead with that in about 2000, 2001, and then, and then the, the, the not-for-profit was kind of got their act together a bit and did a deal with another company called Comindico. Anyway, long, long short, we ended up starting that business called Pipe Networks, which actually stood for Public Internet Protocol Exchange, if, if anyone wants to geek out on that little bit of history. And, and that really was a, a fantastic business. We built what was the largest IX in Australia, built Metro Fibre Networks, supporting a lot of the competing fibre networks. We also built a submarine cable to Guam and, and a bunch of DCs uh, that a lot of the industry participated in. Neutral, open, inclusive. Subpartners built a submarine cable. They had the idea for building a submarine cable from uh, APX, US, Australia, Sydney, Sydney to Singapore, called APX, Asia Pacific Express. Um, ended up uh, doing two thirds of that. We ended up doing uh, Sydney, Perth, Perth, Singapore, and um, became Indigo. We brought that together. Then I, I started, um, after I kind of sold Pipe, I, I, I took that month off and at the same time, I, uh, well, after I took a month off, the next month I started Next DC. Uh, again, having this vision to kind of, let's build neutral infrastructure for the industry. Um, and Australia didn't have a, a nationwide uh, independent data centre operator. So that's when I started Next and then the cloud came along and I thought, God, you know, no one's doing connect connectivity. We need to do networks like cloud does to compute. We started Megaport. That's been a pretty pretty crazy ride, uh, 25 countries, it's been pretty cool. And Superloop, as people probably see on the TV a little bit these days, which, is, uh, which actually started as a spin out of the fibre assets of Megaport uh, because it was confusing what Megaport did. So I spun the fibres out and then, lo and behold, we ended up turning into um, Superloop and what it is today. So today I'm, I'm, I'm repping what we call SODA, and another acronym that people don't know about, except for probably the people in this room now, it actually stands for the Slattery uh, Family Office of Digital Assets. And it's got a, a, three kind of key pillars in what we do. So most of you guys know me for infrastructure. Uh, we build pretty decent infrastructure around Australia and, and, and Indo-Pacific region. Another really key uh, stream is sustainability. What most people probably don't know is I grew up in Rockhampton, well, you know that part, but we used to go snorkeling and swimming and fishing and skiing back in those days uh, with not a lot of supervision. So we, uh, I had a love for the Great Barrier Reef. Fast forward to today, two of my very good friends, there's a bit of a photo going around the internet these days. Uh, they're now some of the most esteemed people in marine biology. One's a tiger shark expert, the other one's deep sea marine expert in, in, uh, in Japan. Um, we, st we, we basically kept together. So I've got this company called Biopixel. If you've seen the David Attenborough Great Barrier Reef series, 35% uh, is actually the content that we actually we own and hold. So we actually hold the largest natural history library on the Great Barrier Reef um, in the world. We, we provide it to all the major production houses. So uh, Disney, uh, pick them, Disney, Amazon, Nat Geo, Discovery, all of that. We, we provide a lot of content. Shark Week, uh, we do a hell of a lot for Shark Week. Uh, we're up for an Emmy this year for, um, for Supernaturals, which is a James Cameron series for the underwater sequence we did in that. So I kind of build submarine, but at the same time, I kind of like the water that it goes in. And of course, we do ventures. The only thing I'll note in ventures, one of the key investments we've made about taking Australian companies global is a company called Fibersense, which I'll talk a bit later in the presentation. So under SOTA, we have this infrastructure part. We've got kind of three main assets in our, in our, um, uh, in, in our fund or actually in our portfolio. Indigo, Western Central, we own a, a quarter pair, we own a bit more than a quarter pair on that, probably about a third fibre pair on that these days. Um, but it's a system that we came up with back at Sub Partners about we need to build this kind of new asset. And uh, in the end, to make it really work, we, we brought, instead of owning it privately, brought together a consortium with people like Google, uh, Telstra, Singtel, uh, Arnet, and, and Superloop uh, as well. Uh, we then, um, I, I kind of had this real concern about what was going to happen with Australia. I could see the, 
the driving of cloud. I could also see that there was real challenges in the Indo-Pacific region in terms of geo geopolitics, but also just getting ships to places. You know, getting permits to operate was going to be really quite challenging. So one of the key concerns I actually had for Australia, it was an opportunity, like every crisis, it's kind of made up of opportunity and threat. The, op the, the threat we had is that a lot of the capacity I could see within the next 10 years that operates from the US to Singapore, uh, and, and, and again from Europe through that way, I could see it coming in a, a lot of bother. Uh, a lot of outages were happening in Indonesia. It takes three months to get a permit to operate through there. And things are getting a little bit challenging in the South China Sea. Uh, you know, nothing, they're just a bit hard to get maintenance vessels to do certain things. And it's, it's not a place you want to keep investing major dollars. So I had this idea of creating a cable that avoided the Sunda Strait, the Malacca Strait, and going express from Australia uh, into Amman in the Middle East. And it's the only express cable. It's the first express cable that actually operates uh, from Australia, connecting directly to the Middle East and onto Europe. And then we, we had this kind of crazy idea to build Hyper One, which is a, a national backbone. And as part of that, the first section we wanted to build of that was SMAP, uh, which is Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth um, system. That's a 16 fibre pair system we're building from, well, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth. Uh, it's a bit of a giveaway, that one. Uh, but it's the first SDM cable we've got running in Australia. It's 16 pairs, 400 terabits. Uh, switching BUs, it's, it's quite a, a fantastic system. Its RFS uh, is currently scheduled for March 2006. It might come a little bit sooner. It should all be done and finished in t at the end of next year. But, you know, with normal testing and things going on and a bit of Christmas, it'll probably happen uh, around March 2006. So what I really want to talk to you today and what the presentation is about, we're not here to necessarily give away all our secret sauce and some of the things that we're doing, but a lot of the stuff we're going to, I'm going to tell you is stuff we'll actually tell our customers. And I think, it's, I think we also, at the same time, actually have an obligation here as network operators to actually share as much of the things that we are doing and some of the interesting things that we're doing to probably lift the standard within our industry. So I'm going to give you, basically today's presentation is going to be a couple of challenges we faced and then how we overcome that, either in engineering, uh, engineering excellence uh, or through situational awareness. And so I'm going to go through some examples of people who are okay with that. So I'm going to give you one of the examples in, in, in what I call excellence in engineering and design, and it's really a significant investment. The SMAP system actually has a series of landings. It's landing in the non-protection zone in Sydney. So it's one of the first landings that's going to happen outside of the protection zone. We all love the protection zone. Obviously, it's protected. But the, actual, the other reason we really like the protection zone is all the permits are pretty much taken care of. You haven't got to deal with the local government. You haven't got to deal with the state government. You know, you've got to do an environmental assessment, but most of that's already been done from the, from the protection zone itself. It's a very easy slipstream fast way to go through that. Now, if you've looked at the protection zones, it is so packed, it's not funny. You can actually probably fit one more cable in the southern zone, but even then, uh, you're going to have to go through some unexploded ordnance areas uh, to actually achieve that. Now... <clears throat> Some UXO zones are red and some are orange. The red ones, they actually mean it. So I won't say which system we were doing. Um, we were doing a grapple run through a, a red zone as a trial and we, we literally pulled up a bomb. And, uh, and not a small bomb, it was actually quite a decent bomb. And, and of course we rang the Navy and said, um, uh, what do we do with this bomb? And, and they just said, put it back. <laughs> so we put it back and we moved on. We didn't go there, we picked a much better zone so we kind of learned a bit about that. But protection zones are really important because it gives us the coverage that we need and also tells marine operators to stay the hell away from what we're doing there. That's, a, that's the third most important piece. So we're out of space in Sydney, so we're actually going to be doing a drill out of Maroubra, uh, which is just to the south of the protection zone. But what we announced yesterday when we did a groundbreaking there, we're actually going to do six drills. So what we're actually going to be doing is doing enough drills, beach manholes, front hall, back to uh, Equinix SY45 or wherever people want to go, uh, to, to not just do our cable but to do the next five cables out of there. Uh, we don't know what those cables are all going to be, but one thing I do know is if you're the local council, if we, the heartache we're going through right now to get the council on board, the state government on board, all these things on board, if I'm going to do it once, it'll actually be easier for me to do for the next five people. And that's one thing that we're doing right now. Um, and so we'll, we'll be looking, but once we've actually got that done, we'll almost certainly be requesting extension to the cable protection zone to actually cover that, that area through there. Melbourne and Torquay. Torquay's never had a submarine cable land in it. And I, I, I was going to show you a slide of it. Oh my God, it's busy. Um, the amount of protections, sorry, the amount of um, unexploded ordinances 
down in Victoria. I just did not even think anyone would bother to blow up that place. Um, you've come from the north. But, but World War II, post-World War II, there's some big rangers out there. They did some crazy shooting. Um, I'll, I'll post online some, what we had to do. And the, the number of ships, uh, basically ships that are from, protected through there, it was threading a needle through the haystack. Uh, or sorry, threading the, needle, the eye of a needle, not the needle through. It was threading the eye of a needle to find a slot that we could actually do the landings that we needed to do. Um, but we're doing two landings there in, in Torquay. Adelaide, uh, we're doing one, we're doing, we're doing one in, in Perth as well, in the PZ. Uh, Adelaide's a non-PZ as well. And I'm gonna take you through Adelaide. And, and building cables, it looks easy. And it's not. Um, but I'm gonna take you through an example of what happened in Adelaide, but how do we do engineering excellence? So, oh, actually, before I do that, one thing we decided to do in the system, for anyone who's over 50 probably understands the movie, there's a movie called Full Metal Jacket, right? There we go. Um, so we, we kind of made the decision with SMAP to do something that no one had really done before, and that's actually not do any, uh, uh, any poly jacket outer sheathing onto the system. So we actually did this engineering to say, you know what, Let's do the risk assessment, let's do the cost base, let's figure this out. When we actually looked at, the, we, so every time we do a desktop survey, we look at what happens, then we send a survey ship out to go do the survey, or a series of ships to go do the survey. Just for SMAP, the survey cost alone was nearly $20 million um, to do that survey. There's a hell of a lot of survey work, a lot of shallow water that's in there. And really the thing that when you understand when you're building across the Southern Ocean, I don't know if you've ever been, well, if you've ever been there in winter, it gets a little choppy. Um, massive seas, you know, eight, ten metre swells quite easily uh, during that period. And it's not, it's not that you can't lay or can't repair, but it's really difficult to do. So and, and the good news is it's a very benign ocean floor. People don't fish down there. People don't do those types of things. So we made the, so 70 per cent of the trunk on SMAP was able to be lightweight. Around half of that uh, was in the southern ocean area. The cost to repair if there's an outage is somewhere between two and three million Aussie. The cost for us to upgrade and actually put the whole lot as, as, um, as lotway protected, as they call it in ASN land, it was about $10 million. Now, my return on investment of actually getting, you know, uh, four repairs, we'll get that. Now, Indigo's been there and, and it, it's done some upgrades, but there's some parts it didn't do lightweight protected. And that was a decision on the consortium. It hasn't had an, oh God, anyone got a bit of wood? Throw me a pencil, sorry. <laughs> no, really, throw me a pencil. <laughs> I am superstitious on this point. I don't like to tempt fate on networks. Um, Indigo Central hasn't had an outage uh, in the five years it's there. Incredibly reliable. Uh, and and that's, that's a real testament to, to going subsea versus going terrestrial on some of those routes. You know, there is no other long haul link in Australia that comes close to not having an outage in five years. Um, I'm not going to tempt fate, but you can imagine if it was fully armoured, how much better that should be. I'm going to do that. But the real, one of the real parts of the decision to do this is that we want to avoid an outage. We don't want to shunt fault or a break. We don't want to have to send a ship in the ocean. We want to make sure our customers have the confidence to know that if I'm buying capacity on that system and on that leg, then they've really done the investment and the engineering to get that right. Now let's look at Adelaide. And the talk here was, was hard. <clears throat> Adelaide was hardish. Uh, we not, haven't built it yet, but we did the survey, 330 kilometre branch from the branching unit into Adelaide to West Beach near the airport for those who are local to that area. The majority of branches in shallow water, sub 60 metres. Um, it's a 16 fibre pair trunk. Uh, it's able to be uh, it's fully switched. We could switch some, none or all uh, into Adelaide. Uh, in terms of that, we can, we can do, uh, but it must be in out. So we do eight in, eight out or five in, five out, whatever it might be. It's uh, the first long haul submarine cable that actually goes into Adelaide, fibre optic cable. I can't tell you what happened in the 1800s. Um, there was probably a copper cable run somewhere at some point, but there certainly hasn't been a fibre optic submarine cable in, in my living memory or even my, my lifetime. Now, this is what it looked like when we did the desktop survey. This is when the people with the bathymetry charts and all the navionics, all that stuff, saying, this is what we're looking at. Now, the orange is uh, single armour. The red is uh, double armour. And green is lightweight. Now, lightweight protected, sorry. Obviously, we don't do any lightweight. It's all lightweight protected. And this is basically the length of the branch getting at the branching unit. Now, we did a survey, and we had a look at a number of things. This is the kind of more inshore part. There's sea grasses there. There's, uh, there's a nice dive spot which we knew about. All this kind of interesting stuff. But this part, 
is just part of life when you're actually building a system. Now, if you look at those two charts there, you see those kind of black lines that go across that chart? So that's trawlers that are scraping the bottom of the ocean floor. And, and they're reasonable scrapes. They're, they're pretty, what are called, chunky scrapes. So a lot of us, the, these do happen, right? Let's be really clear. So then, but what, what you have to do, you always, you, you up armour and you bury. Well, you always bury, you always try to bury. Be, try to bury deeper is the point. So post-survey, this is what it looked like. So a lot more double armour, a lot more single protected. But we made the decision to do this. So we're double arming the entire lot. We're two metre barrel where we can. Um, the, there's a section when we come off the shore where the seagrass is, we don't want to disturb that. So what we're doing is we're doing arc, uh, double armour, arc, articulated pipe, so it's incredibly protected, uh, bolted down. So that's kind of a part where that's, that, that alone, you know, in terms of cost, it's roughly about $20 Aussie a metre to, for the cable to get it installed to do that. So that's a, all in probably about a $7 million uplift in price for us to do that. But that's, that's a commitment we always make to do that. And when you're, when you're in these projects, you're always going to be given these decisions, these variations. And you'll have to sit there and say, what am I going to do? Am I going to, well, you always, if you're not prepared to do what the engineers tell you to do, you're in the wrong business, right? Period. But at times, you also got to think commercially, and commercially not the way that they think, but commercially how I think, I'm thinking, if I don't have to carry as much lightweight and I have just single, single protected on that section, my sparing is less, my confidence is higher, I can rest a hell of a lot easy. And that's typically how we do it. Another thing that we did, so another thing that we did in terms of that, we also inserted two fibre strands in the cable. And that's something like additional fibre strands, and I'll go through that in a second. It's something we've done for Oman Australia cable on, uh, on the three landings there. And, and, and the reason we've done two is it's for fibre sensing, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The first one went 50 kilometres out to the first repeater, roughly it's about 50 kilometres to the first repeater. And the reason we did that is because the sensing platform that we're using really had a range of around 50 kilometres before it kind of drops off at the end. But I kind of knew that they were going to have a new product coming out in a couple of years' time that could pump at 150 kilometres. So I added an extra fibre strand to take me to the second repeater and kind of go from that. The sensing doesn't go beyond repeaters, but well, I said, okay, hang on, I've, been, I've seen this movie before, I'm gonna make sure, seeing all those trawler marks, I'm gonna put the fiber in here and do that. And you'll see some pretty cool stuff for the reasons why. The last thing we're gonna do in Adelaide, we're gonna work with the state government, we're already working with the state government to get a, a protection zone of sorts declared over the cable. Now I'm gonna talk about operational awareness really quickly because this is part of engineering. You know, the thing, the thing I, I hate, and, and Please understand, operationally as a business, you're always starting up, you're always doing things. But my operational awareness mantra for this year was, I need to know of an outage before the customer calls. And it's whether it's a, a patch or this or that, but I need to know. So some of the core systems, things that we do within it, and how do we kind of make sure we do that, is it's the basic stuff we all should be doing, right? Um, so in our world, you know, material changes in operational levels, it's an indicator of anomaly within the network. So we're a system failure, or degraded performance, or some form of external interference. So the key operation platforms we operate internally uh, or for our systems, the PFE, power feed equipment, uh, the SLTE, uh, the bunch of the optical systems as well. And we look at the you know, voltage, power, current, optical power, every amplifier, we poll everything. You know, we're pushing the suppliers right to the edge of their, you know, people don't want to normally interrogate the amplifiers every hour. Okay, we'll do it twice a day then. But we want to see the power output of every line on every amplifier, and we have to, the only reason we can do it two a day, when you've got 111 in a row on, on, on OAC, and we'll have about 60 on, on, on SMAP, it actually does it in serial, so you've kind of got to go run back, run back, run back. But that's what we do, and we're pushing it incredibly hard. Reasons why? Well, if there's a voltage change, there's something not going right, right? If there's an optical change, sometimes a pump and a laser might degrade over a period of time. If you're just looking on that day, it might look okay. But if you actually have a 12-month, 24-month, 36-month view of this, you can actually see that the power level's kind of going through that, and if you kind of draw a straight line, we're probably going to have a failure in 12 months. Let's not wait for the failure, let's actually plan for that. We had an anomaly happen actually in May, and it happened again uh, in July. And this is one of those things. This is the, so basically, I don't know, who knows submarine cables reasonably well? Who doesn't? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> submarine cable, in a real simple case, it's powered at both ends, uh, DC voltage. Uh, this system, so this is OAC. The OAC system's uh, 9,000 kilometres. It runs at about 12,000 volts. 
it runs about 0.8 amps. And the reason it does that, so every 100 kilometres, a bit less, 1995, there's an amplifier to just boost the signal along. And it's powered from both ends in the copper conductor and the cable. They run at about 250, 300 watts or something like that. Um, yeah, thereabouts, 150, 200, whatever, not important. But basically what happens is that one, one will operate at minus, let's say it's operating 12,000 volts, one operates at minus 6,000, one operates at plus 6,000. Right, you can probably pick the cable up in the middle of the cable, it's gonna be zero volts in the middle. And the reason for that is that if there's actually a shunt fault, if that outer jacket you know, gets exposed to the water and earths, then the two systems can actually power what it needs to power to, the, to that new middle point where it's earthed. So if it happened one third the way, this will operate at, min at plus 6,000 volts, or sorry, it'll operate at uh, plus 4,000 volts, this one will operate at minus 8,000 volts. All right, so it'll actually, com it'll compensate for it, or I think it's pretty much right, but it, it compensates for it and you actually don't lose the system in an, earth, in an earth scenario. The other one is if you lose the power feed equipment, at one end, that's fine. The other one will push it all the way through. It'll power the whole system. It's, it's, it's kind of level of redundancy that's in that. Now, when those voltages, voltages kind of go, you, you start packing it, right? Because you think, oh, God, I think we're going to get a shunt fault or, you know, something's going wrong. Someone's touching the cable. You know, paranoia goes through your brain. So we saw this. We started going, what the hell's going on? And we saw it like the way we did because we, we interrogate power you know, every, I think, 15 minutes across the PFE. Now, I know the Vocus guy is going to give a much better presentation on this tomorrow, so I've, I've got rid of all my slides except for these two. But the, a bit late, I've already done it. But anyway, so this is an example of operational. And what was it? Was it a shark bite in the cable? Was it, you know, it was a solar flare. So the solar flare that's actually, you know, coming from, you know, well, however far the sun, of, sun is away, which is quite a way, kind of coming down. This is basically a big copper conductor that goes across the earth. So we saw this, we got on it, we thought, what the hell's going on? And then we actually saw the voltages change in some other systems that we, we were, were involved in. And then we kind of, we, it took us a day to figure it out and we went, oh, it's a solar flare. So on this occasion, it wasn't quite what we were, what we were hoping it wasn't. It's probably the right way to put it. But the point I want to take you now is a situational awareness piece. And that's where we're going, well, that's where we already partly are, but that's where we're going to be fully committed by the end of next year. I want to know of an outage before it's an outage. That's a challenge I sent for the team for next year. <clears throat> One of the key parts of this is our partnership with FibreSense. Now, hands up, uh, I was chairman and I'm a major investor in the company, and I, I did that because I believe in Australian technology with global ambition, and this is was some of the sexiest, and is some of the sexiest technology I've, I've had the privilege to see, certainly built in Australia. Now, I've got a couple of slides of this. Uh, so basically, long short, there's a, there's an interrogator unit, shoots a light down. There's actually probably a better slide here. A little bit of video, I think. There you go. Pretty little animation. Sends a pulse of light down. It gets a backscatter that comes from that. It, and, and there's a number of systems that do this. That's not that extraordinary. It's been around for a while. The really interesting part about this, and what FiberSense does, it's, it's the DSP, the digital signal processing, and, and the machine learning they've applied, and the software and the algorithms they've got. It was actually founded by um, uh, a guy called Mark England, who's, who's an absolute propeller head. Dr. Mark England um, worked on a whole bunch of stuff, including, uh, including I don't know, anti submarine warfare type stuff using photonics. Anyway, he then got acquired by Subcom and then worked in terrestrial and then kind of had this idea of using telecom cables to do this kind of work. So basically, he, he's been working, his team's been working both here in the US on, without question, the best DSP in signal processing. And why is it important? Well, I'll show you right now. And this is kind of how it works. And actually, let me give you, like I did in the submarine cables, let me give you the, the simple summary of what FibreSense does. <clears throat> I've got a 50 kilometer, 50 kilometer span, let's say, a fibre in the street we operate on today. It sends this down. We can basically turn that 50 kilometer strand into 5,000 virtual uh, microphones or acoustic sensors is probably the way to put it, acoustic sensors that are there. Now what's incredibly interesting is that over the years he's found a way that we can actually, they can actually be aware of what each one is doing. So it actually creates a phased array. And then what's even cooler than that, he can actually beamform. So he can actually start steering some, all of these virtual sensors towards a target. And the reason we started that was when we started looking at cars. So the, the fiber I had running back at Superloop days in Singapore uh, and here in, in Sydney, we started seeing, yeah, we actually, it actually, from Mascot, just down the road here, um, from there to Global Switch, I think it was back in the day, we were there looking for people excavating. And then we started seeing this really big waveform go through. 
And it was a train from Mascot Station going. So all of a sudden we started realizing, oh, it's a train from Mascot Station. So we started timing the thing, we could tell the train. Then we started seeing cars, then we started seeing motorbikes, then we started seeing things. But then we started trying to figure out how does this vehicle traveling on a three-lane highway, is it, is it a small, is it a massive truck or is it five cars together? You seen Top Gun? You know, there's two MiGs, there's five. You know how they're all kind of on each other? Same issue. So basically, we've got beam forming happening, so we could actually tell what lane, we could actually focus some sensors to be focusing on that lane, some on that lane, and some on that lane. It's really incredibly cool technology. So basically, this, this bit of hardware, we can turn into these, these acoustical sensors, or these sensors, vibrational sensors, and we actually create a phased array that we can also beam form a bit further down. Now, when, when, when people think about what am I doing with this in terrestrial, I think, you know, I build submarine cables, what am I worried about? People think I'm worried about that. What I'm really worried about is that. <laughs> it's this kind of idiot swinging off a bloody excavator that hasn't looked at dial before you dig, right? That's the guy I'm actually really worried about. I'm not worried about the other stuff because they're probably a lot more sophisticated than that. You know, post hole diggers. Who's heard stories about a post hole digger hitting a fibre cable, wrapping around, snap, 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 200 metres either way, direct buried, that's a nightmare. So that's certainly what I do worry about and worry about quite a bit. So, so from a terrestrial fibre sense deployment perspective, our entirety of our Australian front haul and back haul is actually uh, fibre sense um, uh, enabled across the entire platform. It provides us with situational awareness of all key threat vectors, uh, external aggression, including saw cutting, excavation, horizontal drilling. It also provides awareness of people working in or near our network uh, to the point where it can actually detect people opening manhole covers. I'll give you an example through here. This is an example. We're doing, uh, we've got some network we built in Perth, back in when we built OAC. We're upgrading some of that front hall to accommodate the system we're building now, which is SMAP, and so we're, we're, we're hauling some new uh, subducts through the conduit network that we have there. And this is an example of, you know, hazardous works notification coming in. There's nothing broken, there's nothing going on, but Fibre Sense said, hang on, someone's actually working in your network, and, and you know, and it tells us, oh, someone's working in your network at 8 Tourist Drive, someone's working in your network at 44, 44 Maru, someone's working at John Z Avenue, whatever it is, in Claremont. We get this kind of situational awareness of what's going on within our network without an outage actually happening. I'll give you an example, a real example that happened here in Sydney. This is, a, this is an excavator who nearly died. And I won't say which system, but he was excavating here in Sydney and he was digging on the front hall of uh, a power system that was a, a submarine cable that had 12,000 volts. Did not realise he was digging above a cable that had 12,000 volts on it. Uh, was digging away, detected, sensed, interdiction was sent out to the person saying, mate, what are you doing? I'm digging a hole. Um, it's like, well, you... You know, you, you, you're digging a hole for a Darwin Award, I think. You're probably digging your own grave right there. So, so stopped it, whatever person trained up and understood what was going on. Not only just saved the asset and an outage and the customers, but probably saved someone's life as well. And this is the interdiction report. Mm, probably a bit too much information on there. The really key part about this isn't just catching people, it's educating people. And this is one of the most compelling slides I can have on why you should put sensing on your critical network components, right? It's this, <clears throat> when people know that you've actually got sensing on your network, we now put plaques on pit lids saying this is actually 5% aware. The behaviour of people happening there completely goes, what we call rogue incidents. That's a person digging without a dog for your dig, without a request, without anyone coming and seeing you. It actually goes down and the stats are an 85% reduction over three years. That's a three year time that I've seen, certainly on what we've seen. And, and so when you actually think about some idiot's gonna dig near your area, and cause a problem, you are already 85% less chance of that happening than if he or she's gonna dig. And then you still go out and interdict, right? So this is a really important stat. The, um, making people aware and making they, uh, them understand we're watching. And when they understand they're watching, they go be cowboys somewhere else. When it comes to sub C, you know, if you read all the press lately, this is what people probably think that I worry at night. But I'm telling you, what I worry about is these two idiots, <clears throat> right? I worry about shipping containers with big anchors and usually in bad wind, and I worry about trawlers or fishing or whatever it might be, just fishing activities of some sort. And here's the reason why. Those red dots on that there, they're actually cable repairs over the, the, over the last probably 20 years. And you can see the activity where there's kind of this compression and population. The majority of these outages are caused by rogue fishing, anchoring activities, dumb systems that aren't aware, often vessels conducting illegal fishing and cost recovery. In Perth, who remembers the outage that happened a couple of years ago now? You would, Gav. 
<clears throat> this is actually what occurred here. We've actually got the, the time horizon here. And the thing I want to point out to people is that this ship was anchored close to a protection zone in 10, meters, in 10 meter seas in incredibly high winds, so big it should have been in port, didn't want to pay the money to get in port, but its anchor started lifting. It did not have the capacity that, that, to, to hold the ship in place. And it dragged the anchor, that orange, orange line on the chart there, you can actually see it going. It took out, uh, took out three systems or two systems and it was very close to taking out a third. In, as a matter of fact, in, if, if it had not been able to start the motors, lift the anchor, get going, as it did right there, or if it would have been another 12 minutes, all four systems would have been taken down, and it would have been another 12 minutes after that, it would have beached itself on a reef uh, not, far from, not far from Perth. You know, it does not get enough, uh, does not get enough coverage that it should. So sensing is incredibly important. As I mentioned fishing, this is a live example, not a live, this is an example of fibre cents being put on a submarine cable, I shouldn't say where, but whatever, um, uh, on a submarine cable, and this is the number of incidents of fishing that's actually gone on over that cable. Buried cable, that's okay, but it's, it's seabed interaction that shouldn't happen. The fish, fish people, fishermen have been told, don't fish there, but this is, what, this is their activity, and you can actually see the, the pass that these people have been doing across the cable, and this is the nets that's dragging on the bottom. These things scrape pretty deep, well, not pretty deep, but they, they scrape along, and over time, same place. So this is a strike alert. Something happens, we, we can interdict, send the ship out, but we also have what we call sense of fusion. We actually link the ROS beacon system with, the, with, with the, the activity. And what's even better is that the guys of Fibersyn are able to get the signature of the vessel and its engines, so even if they do turn off their beacon, they can actually track the vessel regardless to know where their activity is, up to about six kilometres away. So six kilometres from, if you come within six kilometres of that boat, basically comes within six kilometres of that cable again uh, for the next five years, it'll able, it be able to detect it even if it's got its sense, uh, even if it's got its AIS beacon turned off. Why? They're bloody loud, these trawlers. Like they've got these two diesel things that da, 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 all the way through. So it's, um, it's like a rock concert in the bottom of a ship. But here's another stat I want to give you. It's the few that ruin it for the rest. And this is why interdiction and knowledge is incredibly important. Now, it's, this is the repeat rogue fishing activities along that path. There is one operator who has done 20. Right? Now, that, that operator actually takes up pretty much everyone except for the second worst operator combined. The ability to go out and actually interdict that party and then sit there and say, hey mate, we've been tracking you, you've done this 20 times and we're gonna report you to the authorities, their behavior changes. And again, I go back to that. Something that's we're gonna announce here for the first time that, that um, and when I say we, because we actually saw it in one of our, our systems, uh, free spanning. So free spanning is effectively on submarine cables, it's the sections of cable that's suspended or spanned. When we lay the cables, it's supposed to lay perfectly on the seabed. Now, you, at times, you're always going to have a span. Ideally, a couple of metres, best, whatever it might be. And they're in conditions when it's rocky or it's really deep and you don't bury it because you can't bury it at that depth. You've got to make sure you've got enough cable that goes out. So free spanning is where it's suspended over the seafloor with, without being supported by it, as I said, and how it occurs. Now, why it's an issue is that at those kind of points, there's a lot of pressure that's applied to that. And the other issue is the longer the span, the more it gets affected by currents. And the more it gets affected by currents, it starts wearing away the outer of the jacket, and then you get a shunt fault, right? So the problem is when you lay these things two and a half thousand metres deep, no one's going down there to check it after post-installation. <clears throat> now, I've kind of cropped it a bit so you can't tell where it is, but somewhere in our system, there is these spanning events which we knew we would have. We're going down a very rocky, rocky um, uh, drop off. We're going off the shelf, going deep, straight from, you know, probably 100 metres deep to 3,000 metres deep. We found these free spanning instances. And, and how, how do we kind of, well, how do we figure that out? We could see the strumming effect on the fibre within the cable, right? And this is a strumming effect. And there's actually a, a whole mathematical model in this, which I'll, I won't share because I don't understand it. Uh, the geeks do. But you can picture it in your mind, strumming away in the tide. It just does that. Half a hertz to two and a half, three hertz, it does that. The longer it is, the lower the frequency, right? So by doing that, we've been able to actually find out, hey, you know what, there's a span here by both the calculation of the frequency of it and the cable type and some stuff we know about currents, we can actually tell 
how long the span is. Well, we can actually tell because you see the two pinch points in the cable that's there, but we, we're kind of collating all this data and information. And we're actually able to tell you when it's high tide or low tide, right? High tide, not much current, whatever going on, uh, and you can kind of see that kind of that effect there. Now, free spending is something we've seen before. It happens in aerial networks, and that's where the data that we, coll we collected for this. Right, so we've actually been able to work on the, the, the OPGW and the long haul networks that go overhead. But it's amazing tech and it's amazing geekery that kind of comes to that. Why is it important? We're actually able to look at, by taking that data, compare it against the, uh, the, uh, the, the limitation of that cable type at that distance, and we can actually count, over distance we can count exactly how long that span is, and more importantly, the number of kilonewtons that's applied on the, tension, on, on, the, on the points of which the cable actually stops the span and hits, hits that. And we can actually figure out, is that below or above the acceptable limit of that cable? And that's incredibly important. And the reasons for that are this. Today, the only way you'd find out about that is when you have a shunt fault or a cable break. That's it. And what happens there? An alarm goes off the cable break, system down event, you've got to contact your maintenance operator, see when the next available vessel is available, which, which, which has to be stood up. It could be, it could be as far as Taiwan, it could be as far as wherever it might be, and it could have two other breaks that it's fixing right now. You're third in the queue. Then the ship's got to get sent down. It'll probably have to go to the depot to get your spares, which is in uh, Batam, then kind of come through, then jump on site, then cut the cable, then lift, then repair and go away. Now, if that happens in Indonesian waters, you add three months in permitting on top of that, right? So it's going to be a minimum three-month process to do that. That's how we do things now. In terms of soon and what we're doing right now, you know, what, what already we can do, we can actually see an ability to see what's happening. So what we can do instead of that, we can do a, a, risk, a risk assessment of it, we can actually do a determination, we do a planned outage, we can get everything ready, get all our permits, get the ship ready, all the spares collected, go and effect a repair before it's an outage, Two to three days, every time. A much better process. But the even cooler thing is on SMAP. So we're gonna do the shore end, this thing, while the ship is in the area, we're actually gonna see, before they leave, whether there is any such free span issue. And so before they even leave the area, they can, re they can lift it up again, relay it again, make sure it's fine. That's just a really good example of some of the geekery in that. And very similar to exposure. Cable exposure is a real problem because anyone with an anchor can pick it up. I shouldn't quite, it's not quite like that, like a mum and dad boat, not really, um, unless they're really committed. Um, even then, you know, not going to get there. Um, but this is what happens with this. So we can actually tell cable exposure, not because there's a big strumming effect, but there's a whole other thing that, that actually happens over that. Um, so this has already been happened on a power cable somewhere. Um, this has happened uh, on a, another submarine cable as well. So knowing that it's exposed gives us a chance to send the, sh the, the drone back out and rebury it. Very important. This is kind of engineering at its best. Now, for the geek in you, or all of us, I'm a big ocean fan. We also, you know, detected a whale, and it was an Omera whale, right? We actually could tell which whale it was um, because the frequency. This is a, a buried because whales give it a very low frequency um, uh, sound, you know, when they're making when they're making calls. And we're able to detect that through the frequency band and everything, we could tell it's a, not just a whale, we could actually tell where the whale was. And we're, the geeks were very excited. Um, again, because it's a phased array that operates over a 50 kilometre span, you can actually tell exactly through triangulation where this thing is. And I, I think lastly, pretty close, I think lastly is tsunami detection. And for the real geeks in us, uh, there's a, a, a pretty devastating earthquake that happened in New Zealand uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, it was detected, the earthquake component, which is the, the shaking of the ground, was detected in, in all the capital cities in Australia that we had, or they had assets in. But the really kind of interesting part is we actually detected the tsunami that came out of that on Bass Strait. Now, the tsunami, before I got to Bass Strait, calculated roughly 800 kilometres an hour it was travelling through the water at about an inch high. By the time we got to Bass Strait, it slowed down because, you know, shallow water waves increase in amplitude and whatever. Um, it became a, a one-foot wave travelling about 100 kilometres an hour. It had a wavelength of 700 metres to a kilometre. Like, not easy to see kind of thing, right? You know, it's... Anyway, if you're into waves... <laughs> I, I like it. <laughs> um, look, I'm not a surfer. Uh, 
more of a whale. Um, so I'm a diver, that's what I am, I'm a diver, thank you. Uh, but it, it's really kind of amazing, and from a, from a tsunami detection uh, opportunity we actually have, there's a lot of these cables that are already in, in the ocean. A big props to Southern Cross as well. Uh, the, the first, they've been a tremendous supporter of FibreSense as well, and, and that, they've now deployed it. The difference is I made sure that I had fibre in, uh, in all my cables dedicated for this, now, FibreSense can actually do it in the L-band, uh, and it's all been qualified with all the NEC, ASN, uh, subcom uh, repeaters that are in the system. It's very important. Just because it says it can work, you could actually blow up an amplifier, take a system down, so they don't do that. Um, but Southern Cross has done an amazing amount of trials of these guys, and so Southern Cross have now deployed that on their existing systems within their existing fibre in the L-band outside of that. So uh, a big props to those guys. So look, I, I think moving forward, where are we as subco and soda? We're focusing on really two things. Uh, something we call event centre internally, and digital twin. So long, short, every piece of equipment, every patch, every connection, uh, every PDU, every rack, uh, absolutely everything is going to be monitored. Uh, there's, there's nothing we will not be touching. It will all be tracked and logged. We're ingesting it into one of the operation, uh, operational intellig intelligence systems. I won't say which one because we're moving away from another one. Um, it's, it's just starting to rip us off and there's a better one. So, so basically, but we're doing that. And if you're actually going to come down this path, make sure you store your stuff in open, what we call a platform called, a, system, a protocol, a system called open telemetry. There's a standard called open telemetry. You save everything in open telemetry. Don't lose that data forever. And then you can actually kind of make sure you've got that. So we've, we've been recording stuff for 12 months, but where we're really going for is a digital twin. So we've been doing an audit process. Every single piece of equipment, no matter how small it is, every cable, it, just everything is being recorded uh, in both uh, our, in our spatial systems that we operate. Um, you know, our customers of ours within the next probably three months or so will actually be able to see every component of their circuit from end to end uh, within, within the portal uh, and how it's operating. And, and the reason we're kind of doing that is we want to make sure that uh, we can represent our entire network and know the temperature, the power, uh, the door access, every rack in our network globally will have a camera front and back of the rack. Uh, it, it will have every, every facility we have will have facial recognition cameras. And you know, why the camera in the front or the back? Very much like that story I gave before about fiber sense. If people know you're looking, they behave a different way. In Singapore, we found a five meter patch lead in a two meter rack. You know, oh, we need a patch lead to connect from this, whatever, whatever. There, there, back of the rack, front of the rack, up the rack, 20 centimeters away. I was like, oh my God, you know, whoever, I want the camera so I know who I need to punch in the head. Anyway, <laughs> I'm not a violent person, I, I give some love, I give some love. Um, but that's really a, a really big part and I really want to encourage everyone, how we harden our network is that we grab as much telemetry as we can, we understand our network, what's going on with it and how we can improve it and it's a, it's a process of continual improvement. So um, with that, I, I think really I'll, I'll just open any questions that anyone might have and, and just want to thank uh, Osnog for their time, thank you. Thank you.